Good morning and welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. We are currently uh, studying about the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Revelation means the, um, the uh, revealing of what is going to happen. After the book of Revelation, there is nothing that is not covered as far as what's going to happen. Uh, this is the final book in the Bible. It is the final say in God's Word uh, about all issues. Uh, and so we're studying it. Last week we discussed the first chapter in the book of Revelation, which tells all about Christ. It tells about His eternal nature, His true physical appearance, uh, his second coming, uh, his commission of John to write this book. And we began to look at guidelines for studying chapters 2 and 3. If you'll turn to chapters 2 and 3, well, I guess you can't just turn to both of them. So turn to chapter 2, and likely you'll be able to have one on one page and one on the other. That may not be true in your Bible. But uh, we're going to take a look at the seven churches. Those of you that are familiar with the book of Revelation know that these two chapters um, involve letters to the seven churches. I've got these that I need to pass out. Do we have someone that can uh, pass these out? Let me be I better take one here. So uh, there's, there's some more. Um, we're going to get into this a little bit this morning, but this is mainly a study sheet for you. Uh, at home, we will, like I said, we will be looking at it. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the seven churches. The reason is we had a whole series not too long ago about these seven churches. And I would assume, Brother Jim, that you have the uh, data on that series. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that we did in detail. So we will just be surveying, as it were, overview of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Now, one thing we need to understand is that uh, these letters are written to the group, not to any particular individual. It was given uh, to the angel and he and, and the angel uh, sent it to the church of so-and-so. There's seven of them. Uh, the seven churches are mentioned on this sheet. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Um, in some things it uh, in, in some places, verses speak to the individual where it says, uh, as many as do this, or as many as don't do this. So it's kind of speaking to individuals. But it's also mainly speaking to the church as a group. And one of the messages, it says that if this church doesn't do this, then... Uh, the Lord could remove the candlestick from that church. And a candlestick, of course, is its ministry. It's light. We are the light of the world. And so if God extinguishes this light, it's because this church hasn't done its job and it no longer will be a church. We know that this did happen because... There are no churches per se today that fit these descriptions. So evidently, one by one, they uh, dispersed and their candles were, 
were out, so to speak. Um, so keep in mind that some of the things it's talking about is to the group, to the church. And we see this happening today, where there be the church of whatever, you know, uh, the church of whatever today. They may have been very active in years past, and you go back to where it was, and it's not there anymore. And the people have dispersed and gone to other churches. And so at, in, in reality, their candle or their influence or their ministry was gone. Yes, sir? I'm a little confused here. <clears throat> what, the dates? What's that? We'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> get ahead of me. We will get into that. Okay. Uh, we also understand that this thing talks about physical salvation and spiritual salvation. I'm not going to get into that too much this morning, but there is a difference between the salvation of the soul, which has to do with the spiritual relationship with God, and the physical salvation that one may experience. In other words, if one does this, he preserves his life. But if one does that, he's going to lose his life. That's speaking of the physical. So we will have to determine the difference between the salvation of the soul and, so to speak, the salvation of the body, which is physical. David prayed to the Lord to save him. He was constantly praying to the Lord, save me. He wasn't concerned about his soul. He was concerned about his hide because Saul was trying to kill him. And so the salvation he was praying for in most of his prayers concerned his safety, his physical safety. So I just wanted to put that in mind as we go. And as you read, and I'm hoping you are reading these chapters as we are studying them. So when we come across the stuff that you will uh, recognize some of these principles. Okay. Still doing the survey on the seven churches. And I know you say, oh no, here comes that again. The three applications of these letters. All scripture has three applications. Those of you that have been in the Navigator's Bible class have heard this over and over and over again that all scripture has three distinct applications. <coughs> three distinct applications. And this, these two chapters are no different. These are those applications. The historical application, the devotional application, the doctrinal application. In quick summary, the historical said it happened just like this, events. Or it's going to happen just like this, say, prophecy. Prophecy is history that hadn't happened yet. So historical is a relation, or, or a, 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 um, a, what's the word? Prophecy, it, it, the historical application is an account of actual uh, events, okay? Uh, the devotional application is something that we can learn that will help our Christian life. You can get a devotional application from any scripture. You can read in the Old Testament about how David lived his life. And you can say, well, I, wanted, I don't want to do that. Or I do want to do that. And you can see from his life uh, things that would help you in your Christian life. That's just true with any scripture. You can even take the law, uh, the Mosaic law, and you can see the emphasis God puts on certain things. And even though we are not under the law, we can benefit by, well, oh, I don't want to do that. I can see how that would harm me in my spiritual life. Uh, the doctrinal application is the word specific. That's when God writes specific instructions to a specific group of people or person 
at a specific time. And he says, do this now. Um, we see Paul's epistles that he writes. Those are specific instructions for we who live in the church age, for us the, who, who live during the church age. We get our doctrine, our specific instructions from the Pauline epistles. That's an example of a doctrinal thing. The Mosaic law is doctrinal application for Israel because God says, you guys do this. If you do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, then guess what's going to happen? That's doctrinal application, mm. see. All right, so when we get to these seven churches, these two chapters, chapter 2 and 3, we're going to see these particular uh, applications. And we must keep them separate. Um, the historical application is this. Uh, John wrote these letters. Uh, these letters were addressed to an actual church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sars, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Matter of fact, uh, John probably lived in Ephesus before he was taken prisoner by the Roman Empire and uh, banished to the Isle of Patmos. When he was released from the Isle of Patmos in 96 AD, uh, we believe through traditional you know, re, uh, reporting that he went back to Ephesus where he continued to train young men in the things of the Lord. So these were actual churches in Asia Minor, which is the same area that we call Turkey today. Yes? Um, if Smyrna didn't exist or Pergamus didn't exist till later dates, how did he actually write to them if they weren't? Well, Pergamus existed, uh, I think, back to 300 B.C. Don't look at the dates on that sheet. Oh, okay. The dates on the sheet aren't correlated. These aren't dates that... Uh, we'll explain the dates, oh, okay. all right? <laughs> we have not got to that point yet, and, right. and uh, I know my wife said, you shouldn't pass these sheets out until you get ready because they're going to look at that, and they won't listen to what you're saying because, you know, okay. All right, so historically, they pointed to churches that existed at the time that John wrote uh, there is also a historical application in type. In type. These churches can be viewed, and you might say this is the devotional application. It could be that. Uh, that they become types of church age periods in the church age between the time Christ uh, rose from the dead till the time we are taken up at the rapture there are certain ages uh, that these seem to describe to a T uh, Ephesus and you see the dates there from 33 to 100 represents the apostolic period, John being the last of the apostles, or the, the early church age period, the first century A.D. And then Smyrna, the, the uh, age of Smyrna, if you wanted to look at it, would go approximately from 100 to 325. And 325, does anybody know what the significance of 325 is? Constantine. That was when Constantine, who was a Roman um, emperor, 
saw this, quote, vision of the cross, and, and he decided that, that he would be a, quote, Christian. Um, and he put this cross up on the poles that the Romans carried and wrote in it, uh, uh, in hope signal winkies, <laughs> which means in Latin, in this sign you will conquer. Boom. Everybody says Latin knows that phrase, okay? Uh, it's just something you learn in hip hop single winkies. And so he was, you know, going to be a Christian then. Okay, so we kind of pull this at, at the end. There was great persecution during that time, and the Christians were living in catacombs because they were, uh, they were being killed right and left. And so when Constantine came along, they, they were uh, able to come out from hiding and be part of the society. Yes, sir? That's basically the birth of the Roman Catholic Church also. Uh, you could say that. Well, he did say that. <laughs> <laughs> that it was the practical birth of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we see the next period as a period of, oh, by the way, Ephesus means fully purposed. Ephesus means fully purposed. That uh, group of believers were fully purposed. Smyrna uh, means myrrh, myrrh. That was the ointment that they put on dead people. And that was a period in which many believers lost their lives. Pergamos, which began at that uh, about that time, uh, 325, uh, Pergamos means much marriage, much marriage. And what we see during this period is where the pagan Roman system marries the uh, believers or the, the Christians uh, culture and so instead of referring to Juno and some of those Roman gods and goddesses now they're putting Jesus in there they're putting the Father in there, and they're putting the Holy Spirit in there. They're even putting Mary in there as Juno, the dove, who takes the place of the Holy Spirit. So what they're doing is that they're combining Christian beliefs with Roman pagan system. And that, that was the much marriage that is there. I can recommend a book for you if you really have the time and want to put your uh, your time and effort into it. Read the book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. That's a hard book. I've it's a very it's hard, hard book to read. read, but it is documented to the teeth you'll find more footnotes than you find text because he supports what he says so well. He wrote it back in the 1850s, actually. But his whole premise was that this present system that the Romans have is idolatry that began long ago and now it is stuck with, with the Christian influence and ever since then the Romans the Roman Catholic has been classified as Christian what was his last name again? Hislop H-Y-S-L-O-P Hislop um, you can actually download a PDF thing of it and not pay anything for the book didn't say that did I? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> We get our Christmas uh, 
celebrations and stuff is based on the Roman uh, winter solstice. Our Easter is based on the, fish, the feast of Ishtar, which was a Roman god. It is called mm -hmm. Easter. Um, there's a lot of things like that that you that you will see. But at any rate, the church began to be married with the Roman system, and then by 500 A.D. on your sheet, the Church of Thyatira had almost all been compromised, and. You know, between 500 and about 1500, the historical period is called the Dark Ages. Why is it called the Dark Ages? There's one reason, and that's because the Word of God was squashed. It was a forbidden book. It was denied to the public. If the public wanted any spiritual advice, they had to go to the priests, to the clergy, to get any kind of, quote, spiritual help. And as a result, the population was kept under the thumbs, see, of the professional clergy. What was that date again? Between, oh, that's between 500 and about 1500. Um, uh, Thyatira goes about uh, till about 1000 AD, and then the Sardis period goes from about 1000 to 1500. And much of the th same thing uh, is going on in Sardis as, uh, as uh, happened in uh, Pergamos. Uh, if you'll look at verse 20 of chapter 2, it's talking to the, uh, to the church at Thyatira. Um, and it says, uh, uh, Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things with uh, sacrifice to idols. Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, king of Israel. And Ahab married Jezebel, who was a priestess back in Tyre, side in that area, the Phoenician area, which worshipped Baal, worshipped Baal, and he brought that down into Israel. And you know uh, how Ahab and Elijah went back and forth. Well, this same idolatrous system now exists during the church age, and it exists under the cover of Rome. Okay, uh, this, like I said, this is a summary. We don't, we don't have a lot of time to get into it. Uh, and so the Sardis period began to come to an end around 1500 A.D. And we have the Church of Philadelphia. Oh, by the way, uh, Thyatira means odor of affliction, odor of affliction. Um, uh, Sardis means the red ones, red ones. And uh, they, we'll see, had a lot of martyrs during that time. There have been martyrs all through this church age. But I heard somebody say that there have been more believers killed for their faith in the 20th century than have been killed the entire church age. I do not know that. I, I don't have uh, something that I can show you as far as statistics, but I have heard that. Our population is incredibly large. 
and it expanded so much during the 20th century, more than it was during all of those years. Uh, we come to uh, the end of the Sardis period, and uh, we go into the Philadelphia period of around 1500. There are several people came along in 1500, <clears throat> around that time, that began to make a difference. They were Martin Luther. They were a man named Gutenberg, who printed the Bible. And during this time, England was having a battle between Protestantism and Catholicism. And during this time, the King of Spain sent an armada of ships to invade and conquer England and to establish Roman Catholicism once and for all there. And due to unusual circumstances with the weather, with everything else, the armada was, if you know history, I don't have no, to do this. The armada, the armada Armada was defeated, and Elizabeth, uh, you know, the first and all, established Protestantism as a pretty much a firm thing in England. Um, she had her was it her cousin uh, killed, who was the Roman Mary, uh, Queen of Scots, was executed. Uh, there's all kind of things happened there politically that was based in, you know, pol politics and religion kind of go hand in hand sometime, uh, whether we want to admit it or not. But something happened in the 1500s. Well, first of all, the New World began to emerge. We call it the New World. But that's when explorers began to uh, come over and discover a lot of things in uh, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the uh, English began to send missionaries all over the world. The greatest area of missionary endeavor was during this time. The Bible was being printed, and it began to be distributed, and what happened is known as the Reformation. The Reformation. Okay? And there was something else that happened at the same time, because when the population is spiritually devastated, so also will be everything else. So when spiritual awareness began, began to increase, so came the industrial revolution. Things began to happen. Things were invented. And technology began to... Um, come about. So the period of the Philadelphian period, which was 1500 to about 1900, was the age of, that was the age of missionary, the biggest missionary effort. And this church is the only one that has, uh, uh, God does not criticize them. Yes, Jim? Yeah. <clears throat> It's interesting that at that time, the English monarchy was designated the keeper of the faith. I guess that's under Elizabeth, but under the present Elizabeth, about four or five, maybe six years ago, renounced that uh, designation as keeper of the faith. That I know nothing about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but Philadelphia... 
was the church of brotherly love. You know, that's what it means, brotherly love, Philadelphia. Um, and it says in uh, verse 10, Thou hast kept my word. They kept his word. That's when the scriptures came out through guys like Erasmus. Uh, the texts began to be printed and translated and it spread and there was great blessing. You had real revivals that happened around. Uh, you had revivals in which people quit drinking, quit even spitting on the street. I mean, it was that intense, uh, some of the things. Read, read up on Billy Sunday, and now that was, in the, that was in the 20th century, but it was a carryover from uh, the 19th century. What happened to end this period? Because we see the number seven churches, Laodicea, from 1900 until the rapture, uh, they have fallen off. The uh, Laodicean period is characterized by this. Thou art lukewarm. Lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot. You know what lukewarm is? Lukewarm is adapting to the environment around it. You set a cup of coffee out. Pretty soon it's going to be at room temperature. You set a glass of iced tea out, pretty soon it's going to be at room temperature. And that's what believers have done in the night, in, in the 20th century, is that they begin to look like the environment around them. I don't have to go into detail. You know what I'm talking about. You know examples of it. But the, the thing that really ended this was when at the end of the 19th century the Greek text that this book was translated from began to be rejected by uh, religious people by even biblical scholars and they adapted some of the old, uh, uh, some of the texts that were rejected before and came out with many of these new Bibles mm -hmm. which watered down the deity of Jesus Christ, see, which attacked his virgin birth and a bunch of other things that I don't have to go into. But you start dulling the sword and it becomes ineffective. And that's what began to happen. And that is what ended the uh, Philadelphian period. We are currently in Laodicea. We see uh, in verse 20 of chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's outside his own church. He's been put out. Something has substituted, been substituted for Christ. Uh, and he's saying, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he will hear me. We see Christ is outside of the church. There are hymns today that you'll hear that don't mention the name of Christ. They talk about feeling good. They talk about, oh, you know, that this, this happened to me and whatever. But they never mention what Christ has done for us, what Christ can do for you. And, and he's outside his own church. Yes, sir. Did you ever hear the expression of there's only one door knob and it's on your side and you've got to open the door or he's on the other side? Yeah. That's a, that's a good uh, illustration. But he is outside, and this is going to be the nature of believers at the end of the church age. 
we are lukewarm. You know, iced tea <clears throat> tastes really good because it's cold. Hot coffee tastes really good because it's hot. But it's that middle, that in the middle that it's, we got no use for. Um, anyway, I'm not going to belay the point. Okay, that is sort of the historical devotional account of it. it these, these churches are types of those periods, and I just put that in there for, for basically your study. We get to the doctrinal thing on this, and we see some unusual stuff in these churches. Um, if you'll take your Bible and look at Revelation chapter 2, talks about the overcomer in verse 7. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Now where, where do you find in the Pauline epistles where it says, if you will overcome, I'll let you eat of the tree of life. That's not doctrinally for the church. But it is doctrine for people that are living here. Now suppose these people are living here and they face that guy, the Antichrist, which we're going to learn about in chapter, <coughs> chapters 4 through 19. We're going to learn about it. He says that you have to worship him around here. He sets his image up. If you don't worship him, he will kill you. If you don't take his mark, he will kill you. And overcoming to these people here meant not bowing and worshiping him to the point to where they lose their life. Jesus said, Whosoever will save his life will lose it here. But those that lose it, their life, for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So they get killed here. They have overcome the beast. And what happens? They get the right to the tree of life. Everlasting life. The tree of life. We'll be discussing the tree of life. Not today, not next week, but we will. If you look at um, chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 11, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Whoa! Now we know the second death is hell. So if a person overcomes... The beast, he won't be hurt of the second death. I will say this to you. What a person does at that time determines what he has inside. If he is a believer, if he is born of God, read 1 John, the whole book. Whosoever is born of God does not do that. See, he will not worship the beast. He will not take his mark because he is born of God and he does not <laughs> sin that sin. But if he is overcome with the beast and falls down and worshiped him, guess what? He is doomed. So in a way... What happens here shines a light on what a person has inside. See? James said, I don't care what you say about having faith. Show me by your works that you have faith. See? I'm not so interested in what you say. I'm interested in what you do. Well, that's what's going to happen over here. They may say, oh, you know, well, we believe in all... But if they wind up falling down and worshiping the beast, that's proof that they weren't believers. Or they would not have done that. Now this is tribulation doctrine for individuals who will live during this time. That is the doctrinal application. You try to put this in the church age, 
you've got people earning their salvation and a whole bunch of other things that are not applicable. You want church doctrine? Go to the Pauline epistles. But you realize this arrow right here, we're going to be gone. Boom! All that's written to the Paul to the church, the Pauline epistles, what do these guys have? What scripture do they have that's aimed at them? They're going to have to have something specifically for them. You know what they've got? They've got the general epistles. Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. You read those books, you'll see doctrine that applies to these people here. Okay? Not these people here. Yes, sir? Those people there in seven years, is that going to be Gentiles, Jews? Or yes. Both? Everybody. Anybody Gentiles and Jews. There will be no church. Remember, the church is right. neither Jew or Gentile, but we are one in the body of Christ, and I have taken too long here this morning. I probably should have, would have been a safe bet that I would do that. We'll finish up these churches with about five minutes, and then we will get into Revelation chapter 4 next week. Alright? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you gave it to us. What a gift, your word. As many people in times past did not have the complete word of God. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, help us to be witnesses for you in everything we do. Guide and service following in Jesus' name. Amen.